So between believer and non-believer, there is no true harmony. In the sermon I say, there's only truths. Sad reality. That's how we live with those who do not share that our faith in Jesus. So let us pray. <clears throat> Merciful Lord, Lord, Lord cleanse and defend your church by the sacrifice of Christ, united with him in holy baptism. Give us grace to receive with thanksgiving the fruits of his redeeming work, and daily follow me to his way. Through the Saint Jesus Christ, your Son of our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And thanks be to God. The Almighty God and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and preserve you. Amen. So, what? I have a disclaimer. What? I read this stuff in the uh, epistle, and I've never heard it before. <laughs> from he, from Hebrews, uh, two things that were in here. Uh, women received back their dead by resurrection, and then what about this person who was sawn in two? So I looked it up. Um, Isaiah by was supposedly the person who was sawn in two. The person that um, received the it, the way it was written, it sounded like somebody in the Old Testament was tortured and then came back to life. No, they were tortured. They died, and because of their faith, they received eternal life. Right. 
The way it's written, it sounds like they came back right away. Not so. No. So it's like, I was reading that going, what? <laughs> so yeah. there you go. Yeah. So it's extra biblical evidence that says under um, Manasseh, um, Isaiah mm -hmm. was martyred and sawn in two. Yeah. We don't have it recorded in the Bible. No. So, anyway, before we get to the plan for the next nine weeks, in the front row, we have Steve, and we have Mary, and then we have Walt and Linda, and then we have David, who's our recorder, and then here, <laughs> we have Andrew. That's right. Pardon? That's right. Donna. Donna. And Howard. And the Menzies. Mm -hmm. Howard and Don. Don. Donna. Boy, my mind is gone today. And Jerome and Diane, and what's her name? <laughs> oh, Barbara, Barbara. <laughs> After 53 years, I should have that name. You're a man. Man. <laughs> and Helen. And then we have Matteo and Kristen and Luca and the one whose name is very hard for me to remember. John. John, yeah. Yeah, I so rarely use that name. I do the JP so often. And ever since seminary days, has been doing the John Paul. Actually, since the Chico State days. When Chico State. Did you mention the whisper? Yes. Oh, you did? Walt, Linda. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And Pat. <laughs> yes, we're here. And David. We are here. I heard David. And David? Yes. It is tennis quiz time. Okay. Okay? You're going to be able to introduce the four new people here because Rick repeats the names over and over again. <laughs> Mateo. Mateo. Kristen. Luca. 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 And yeah. John. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Our plan for the next nine weeks is at least one week we're going to take a look at the Bible narrative, what it is, is it reliable, and some of the kind of manuscript evidence that's out there. Because every time we do Bible study, questions come up about Bible origins. We'll do that today, maybe next week. And then we're not going to have a Bible study on the 28th of August because we're going to have this call meeting between services. And by the time we finish that, there won't be any time to start a Bible study. But either next week or the week after the call meeting, we will begin the book of Colossians. And we'll do Colossians until we finish. Uh, and on the schedule right now, that should take us seven weeks. But if it takes longer, Pastor Fro won't be able to take over for a while. <coughs> and I'll have Bible study every, every week. So, for today, if you do not have an electronic gizmo or a hard-covered Bible, for some of this, you're going to really want a Bible. Because with electronic Bibles, you can 
could look up a passage. But when you go to the next passage, it takes a while to get to it. And I also want to look at the table of contents of the Bible. So, just to most of the that for the next nine weeks, Thank you all. grab the Bible. Closet, mm -hmm. uh, Constantine Codex. I think I've read all of them. They're yeah. good. Pontius Pilate, Flames of Rome. Uh, unlike historic novels, where you don't know if it's really a fact, I love the historic novels of Dan Brown <laughs> because every bit of it is fiction. <laughs> He writes in the front, all geographic places and dates are historically accurate. That's a fictional statement. <laughs> because he says, everybody knows the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1954. 1947. So, and then he gives these if you traveled in the Middle East or traveled in Europe, he takes two different faraway places and merges them as if they're one historic site. That's historic novels. That's how they work. Documentary novels that Paul Meyer writes, every date, every place is accurate. So what's fiction is, the story. But if he tells you such and such as that, and part of it is he deals with the Bible narrative. You read his stuff and you get a lot of the historic, true manuscript evidence that is out there to be learned and discovered. So the Bible narrative. You know, what is it? Is it reliable? Can one actually understand it? And most of all, is it believable? So what is the Bible? Bible is actually a plural word that means books. So it is books. Yeah. It is a collection of books. Old Testament has 39 books. So open your Bibles to the table of contents, if you will. And some of the Bibles that you have the books are listed with page numbers. It used to be when people were just starting the Bible and often had to do it in confirmation classes as well. I couldn't give a Bible address. A Bible address which means the book, the chapter, and the verse. Those were very convenient. We didn't have those for a long, long time. 
it is 16th century that we started getting chapters and verses added. Most people think they were there. <laughs> when you find a Greek manuscript, like Sinaiticus, one of the oldest Greek manuscripts we have, they don't even divide the words or the sentences. Dividing words, creating paragraphs, is all editor's choice. Um, <coughs> excellent section in Paul Meyer's Skeleton God Closet and Constantine Codex is he gives you a picture of a portion of a Greek text and you say, how do you decipher the words? Well, how many of you have tried to learn a foreign language? Yeah. Fine. <laughs> and then you you hear someone speaking that language. <laughs> and what's the big challenge? Slow down. Understand. <laughs> Understand. <laughs> they talk too oh, fast. They talk too fast. In other words, for mm -hmm. our ears, the words are all run on. Mm -hmm. They aren't broken until your ear is trained to hear it. Hebrew separated words. Greek didn't. Mm -hmm. But the Greek could read it because it's like listening to a foreign language. They could hear the words. So if you look at this, page numbers. If you have a Lutheran study Bible, you have consecutive page numbers. Um, even when you look at the New Testament, it doesn't start over with page one on Matthew. You have consecutive page numbers all the way to 2,243. Some of your Bibles will have one set of numbers for Old Testament one set of numbers for the New Testament. And the New Testament has 27 books. Whoops, gotta go back. These books were written by 40 different authors. If you get the Lutheran Witness, this month's issue, is all about inspiration. And although the artwork is misleading, the cover artwork just, I don't like it at all. You've got this guy writing and looking up to heaven like this. Um, no, inspiration, we believe, was total homo the whole person. And how it was communicated remains a mystery, but the artwork of I'm writing down and I'm listening to you dictate this to me. Well, if God dictated it, the language would be the same, the choice of words would be the same in every book of the Old Testament and the same would Every, for the New Testament. Hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, yeah. Paul, Peter, James, and whoever wrote Hebrews, they are totally different people with different education, and most of them are learning Greek as a second or third language. Therefore, their choice of words, their style of writing, is going to differ from book to book to book. And the most eloquent Greek is going to be Hebrews. So, written by 40 authors. Three, three times nine is 27. The easy way to remember the number of uh, books from the Old Testament and the New Testament. 39 in the Old Three times nine gives you 27. 
Anyway. Okay. I just, okay. It stuck with my mind. Maybe it'll stick with some other people. Yeah. It's not just Donna who has an education background here. We hear from another teacher right. who's trying to get us to memorize things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have what? Four teachers in the room? Yeah. Does it, do they for uh, the forty uh, authors include the anonymous? Yes. So uh, the, the the author of Hebrews, like you said, is unknown. But so unknown would be one author. Okay. And you can tell us who's the unknown author in the Old Testament. Job. Job. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, the Job. book of Job. The book of Job. Not, not the man Job is right. un unknown. We know he's a historic person, whether he wrote it or not. Anyway, here we see that the Hebrew scriptures, remember, when we hear scriptures in the New Testament, it's not talking about Old Testament, New Testament. The Hebrew scriptures, with everything that the Hebrews had, in the form of scrolls. We put them in a book form so you can kind of see them. But you notice, um, maybe you'll notice. That the Hebrew scriptures, the Jewish structure, yeah, the first five books, the Torah, when we hear law, we think of laws. The Torah, the law, what we call the law, is actually the revelation. It includes law and gospel. So you have the law. Now notice what they do with the rest of it. We have the former prophets. Most of these we call history. They call it former prophets. And then, they have the latter prophets until they get down to the section called the writings. So, three divisions to the Hebrew scriptures. <clears throat> the law, the prophets, the writings. When you hear Jesus reveal to the disciples everything that was written about him at the end of Luke's gospel account, he refers to the law, the prophets, and the writings. Yes, Mary. It says latter prophets, the twelve. Is that the apostles? Okay. No. Um, Let's say a general language. So the latter prophets start from Isaiah through here. The former prophets give us all the history, and then the latter prophets include all of those. The Hebrew scriptures aren't going to include anything from the apostles. Because they don't accept Jesus. So there was 12 prophets? Yeah. Well, <coughs> you have the latter prophets. You have the three large literary prophets. I mean, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, are the two longest books of the prophets. Ezekiel is that. These we call the minor prophets, which they call the 12. And there were 12 minor prophets, what we call minor prophets. They call the latter prophets. <clears throat> so we have history. We put all of this into history, and then we have poetry and we divide major prophets because they wrote more and minor prophets because they're shorter books. Okay. And then history, we call gospel and acts. We have Paul's letters, about 13. Then the general letters and one apocalypse revelation. <clears throat> so, internal evidence. 
How reliable is this? You can never go into a document and prove its authenticity by what it writes about itself. But there is important internal evidence that we should look at. There's also great external evidence for the reliability of the Bible. But let's take a look. This one, everybody who was recently confirmed knows by heart. Second <coughs> Timothy three. Fourteen to seventeen. <coughs> But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, scriptures, Old Testament writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. <coughs> so, basically says, all of that stuff that we looked at for the Hebrew script, uh, writing, scriptures, was breathed out by God, or inspired by God. 1 Peter 1. One of my favorite sections. First Peter 1. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to walk. In 2 Peter 1, follow cleverly devised myths will be made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. That no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, when was Peter an eyewitness to these things? What 
voice did he hear? Pardon? Mount of Transfiguration. Right, Mount of Transfiguration. There he was. <clears throat> seeing Jesus <coughs> glorified and the voice from heaven that corrected Peter's misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, all of you know by heart if you've been to evening services, right? Mm -hmm. In former times, God spoke to us by the prophets, by the prophets but now he has spoken to us by his son. His son. Yeah. That's in our liturgy. And <coughs> John 1, you know the first verses of John 1. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And Verse 14, and the word became flesh, and the tabernacle tinted, dwelt among us. Yeah. So if Jesus speaks, and we have a record of Jesus speaking, we have the word of God made more sure. So why do questions come up? The writing of speculative books. I mean, the latest one, of course, is the Da Vinci Code. But there have been speculative books written throughout history trying to say, no, this isn't real. Fictional writings that claim to be Word of God. Archaeological work. How many times have you heard on the news seen on the History Channel, read in newspapers or news magazines, something that archaeologists uncovered that cast doubt on the Bible. Yeah, you say there's many. Yeah. I always say, Wait for the rest of the story. Wait for the archaeological evidence that's, that's supposed to cast doubt on the Bible gets debunked. Yeah, it is found to be false scholarship. Most archaeological work that is solid ends up supporting the Bible. One of the biggest things is like the Dead Sea Scrolls. We found a manuscript of Isaiah that was 700 to 1,000 years older than anything we had, depending how you judge our oldest manuscripts. And for everybody who says the Bible's been copied over and over again, and therefore it's no longer reliable to produce a document a thousand years older than anything you have now. And it says, whoops, there might be a dot or a tau, which is the way Hebrew put in vowels, that's hard to read or misplaced but it doesn't change the text at all. And then human suspicious nature. We always think there's some conspiracy. The biggest one is, it was the Roman church that manufactured the New Testament. Yeah, yeah. they threw out yeah, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Peter. Because at Nicaea, the Roman church overran all the other delegates at the Council of Nicaea. Anybody know how many delegates there were from the Christian church when Constantine said, my mom needs to know what is reliable? 
298. Every seed of the Christian church, Antioch, um, Jerusalem, Constantinople, Rome, and uh, the other sea, north coast of Africa, Egypt. Oh well. Alexandria. Pardon? Alexandria. Alexandria. Yeah. The five seas, which means they were like districts of the church. They had a bishop in charge. <coughs> Um, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, Constantinople, the bishops were present. There was no bishop from Rome present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of 298 delegates, how many came from Rome? Oh. So anytime you say the Roman church influenced the final canon or rule of the New Testament, you have to say, uh-uh, not true. Yeah, that's human conspiracy theory. So why are we concerned? We need to know what is divinely authoritative. We need to know that there's no hidden evidence out there somewhere. And we must have a basis to establish Christian doctrine, a foundation to stand out to stand on against false doctrine. So how did the Old Testament get formed? Who was the first author of the Old Testament? Moses. Moses. Yeah? And Moses lived 1600 BC. What happened from the day of creation until Moses wrote down Genesis 1. Oral tradition. If you look at Genesis, Genesis repeats itself over and over again in form and in content. And why would it do that? Come on, teachers. Repetition. So it's giving you a history. Oh. So you can memorize it. Redundancy. Repetition helps you memorize it. Repetition helps you memorize it. Yeah. Repetition is the mother of learning. So you look at the days of creation. Genesis 1. It follows the same pattern for each day. Different information, but the same pattern. So, from Adam to Moses, we have oral tradition. Moses wrote the first five books by inspiration. By the prophets wrote what we call history, as well as the major and minor prophets. <coughs> the writings came from prophets, kings, and the schools of the prophets. If you read about Elijah, when he's ready to pass his mantle to Elisha, you hear about a whole bunch of prophets running around with Elijah. That's his school of prophets. By 200 BC, the three-part camp, Torah, Nebuchadnezzar, and Kethavim, were accepted except for Ecclesiastes and Esther. Doubts were expressed about Proverbs and some discussion as to the authority of Ezekiel had occurred. But by the time of the Council of Jamnia, that's a Jewish council, in 90 AD, objections concerning Ecclesiastes and Esther were settled. The Masoretic canon, or rule, was in place according to the Jewish order. And so we have the writings that were settled for the Old Testament by the Jews.
Yes. Well, this just brought up a question in my mind. So, the Jews, what, what kind of line of authority or did they have? I mean, they had their kings, but I mean, how would they make this decision? They, did, they didn't have a pope and bishops and all that stuff like the church has. So, how did they do that? By 70 AD, the Jews are pretty well scattered and no longer in Jerusalem. But they do have their teachers, their rabbis. And when they had a council, they would have the prominent rabbis gather. So the Council of Jamnia, they no longer have the temple establishment no longer have the synagogues of uh, the Palestinian territory. They're pretty well the scattered and dispersed them. They come together in Jambia and they look at all that they have of collected scrolls and Jews are very careful about their tradition. So now they're going to say, how do we know that this scroll came from the pen of, how do we know this scroll came from the pen of, how long has it been used in the church? <clears throat> you know that that three-part canon called straight edge or rule was in place of law, prophets, and writings. How many lessons do we have on Sunday morning? Three. 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 For us, we have an Old Testament, basically a New Testament, epistle, and a gospel. What did the Jews have? They had three lessons that they read in their service. Law, prophet, writing. We tend to go from, if you will, I'll say it anyway, from lesser to greater. Because you figure the voice of Jesus is, boy, that's really what we want to hear. That's the gospel lesson. They went from the revelation to the prophets calling people back to the revelation to the writings which general life application. So they, they, they went from the greater to the lesser. But they had three. Now, how long have they been doing that? At least 400 years before Christ. At least from the time that they were in Babylon, when they no longer had the temple and the sacrificial system was gone, and they became the people of the book, as they called themselves. And the people of the book remain basically to today. So, as Christianity came in, how do you worship God? We don't need the temple, but let's do what we've learned in the synagogue. For those that were in the early service and those who are coming to the late service, <coughs> the order of our <coughs> service is very much what the Jews did in the synagogue. Very similar. You go to a Jewish service today at one of their synagogues, they might call it temples, but they aren't. And you get what? Roughly the same order that we have. They get three lessons. And after the three lessons, what do they do? They confess the creed. Not our creed, their creed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
and your neighbor as yourself. Didn't do it in Hebrew, but yeah. That's basically it. Yes. So, the Jews, when they gathered in Jamnia, settled all the questions that they were having. Because no synagogue had all the scrolls. Yes? Pastor, looking at the second bullet of this screen, is there any evidence or speculation of when Moses began writing the Pentateuch? No. Well, yeah, there's speculation. Nothing solid. Okay. You know, it's... You can say it was during the wilderness wanderings. Yeah, because he never goes to the promised land. Mm -hmm. No evidence that... Well, you have a lot of evidence of God speaking to him from the time he's called Exodus 4, but never anywhere in the first five books. That, and Moses sat down and wrote these books. You have Moses wrote this song. Moses wrote this song. So you have a couple points. Uh, the one that became a kind of a popular song, yeah, um, Exodus um, 15, yeah, cast the horse and rider into the sea, mm -hmm. says, yeah, Moses wrote this, mm -hmm. but that's about as far as we get. Okay. How did the New Testament come into being? The Gospels were written by the evangelists. We figured it had to be end of the, we couldn't date anything earlier than the end of the first century, 75. Synopticus, the oldest manuscript that we have, um, we thought maybe that's the earliest evidence that we have, and with it we get Mark, not much more. Then there was a person that studies old paper, a papyrus, a papyrus, and he ran across a shoebox in Oxford about 25 years ago. And what does he find? Scraps of a Gospel of Matthew. And it's on an old, old paper. A paper that disappeared around 50 mm -hmm. AD. That's written in <clears throat> one of Meyer's books, if I remember correctly. It could be. Yeah. But anyway, it was a <coughs> Lutheran witness also, and it was in one of my classes. Uh, he finds this old paper, and it disappeared. In fact, the style of the Greek that it's written in, they didn't write in that style beyond 50. Now, of course, we know that cursive writing styles have changed. We're here in 2022, and some of us are writing in 1950 cursive style. Yeah. So and they don't teach cursive anymore. They, they don't, don't teach, teach it anymore. Cursive to when, you, when you're third grade, that's it. Even then. It goes away. So, really? at least they don't teach. Don't ask why. They can't read it then. Right. So, Gary Meyer and I are often handed documents in German 
that people can't read. Why? Because nobody wrote in that style of writing in German after 1920. But because going to school in the 60s in Germany, we learned to read some of that. So you can't put a whole bunch of saying, OK, it must be AD 50 for this Matthew document, but you can on the age of the paper. So contrary to most of what we learned and most commentaries, Mark was not written first. Matthew. And if you wish to pursue this more, we'll look at it more next week. So if you say, I've had enough, <laughs> and we're going to Colossians next week, we'll go to Colossians next week. So to continue this, raise your hand. To go to Colossians next week, <laughs> we'll That's continue right. this, <laughs> and then we will head to uh, Colossians after the call meeting, which kind of makes a good break. Otherwise, we start Colossians and have no Bible study. Okay. So let us close. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Amen.